Hi, thanks. It's an honor to be here with y'all. I'm going to talk about what a nuclear war is because most Americans have no idea uh, that hasn't been taught in public schools for decades. I teach a class on nuclear weapons at the University of Missouri, and I get very bright students that come in, and they really have no idea what a nuclear weapon is or what a nuclear war would mean. Okay, so what happens in a nuclear war? Well, if you happen to see a video by the New York Emergency Management that was released recently, you might get the impression that not very much happens, and it's no big deal. Uh, this is a screenshot from the video. I give you three main instructions. You're supposed to stay inside. Well, get inside, stay inside, and then stay tuned for media alerts. I'll tell you when it's safe to come outside. And this would be laughable. I mean, if it was a satire, but it's not. You know, it's it's misinformation. It's about the worst information you could get right now. I think if you want to understand what a nuclear war is, you need to first understand what a nuclear weapon does. Uh, nuclear weapons were invented during World War II. The United States developed them. Uh, the first nuclear bombs were called atomic bombs. We dropped two of them on Japan at the end of the war. The bomb that was dropped in Hiroshima had an explosive power of 15,000 tons of TNT. Now that compares the largest conventional weapon, high explosive uh, in the US arsenal today has 11 tons of TNT explosive power. So a small atomic bomb is about a thousand times more powerful than a conventional bomb. But speaking of explosive power really doesn't explain at all what a nuclear weapon is. It's, it's like a piece of the sun. And when it detonates it, in one second, it will create a fireball. And the surface of the fireball is actually hotter than the surface of the sun. If you happen to be beneath that, you'll be vaporized. This is a photo of a shadow that was left on the pavement at Hiroshima by a person that happened to be unfortunate enough to sitting underneath the bomb when it exploded. But the bomb also, at, when it, it emits so much heat that it will set fire over a huge area. And, what is a, and it creates a nuclear firestorm. Um, a modern nuclear weapon will set fires over tens or hundreds of square miles. These are set simultaneously and they will coalesce into a gigantic single fire in a matter of tens of minutes. And this fire will have winds blowing in towards the center of hundreds of miles an hour. It's strong enough to uproot trees. Uh, within a few minutes, the air temperatures in the fire zone will reach 400 to 500 degrees Fahrenheit, well above the boiling point of water. And you know, even if you're in a, a shelter underground, you're gonna be cooked. There's no, it'll use all the oxygen up. So, Anyone that's in a fire zone uh, created by a nuclear firestorm is not going to survive. This is a picture of what Hiroshima looked like before the atomic bomb was detonated. And this is what it looked like afterwards, six months after the bomb detonated. About four square miles were set on fire and created you know, this massive nuclear firestorm. Well, modern nuclear weapons are much more powerful. The strategic nuclear weapons that the US and Russia have are seven to 87 times more powerful than the atomic bomb that destroyed Hiroshima. This compares the size of the firestorms of an atomic bomb to um, standard Russian nuclear 800 kiloton warhead. They have 500 of those they can launch in a matter of a few minutes towards the United States. The circle on the left uh, is, um, this fire zone created by an atomic bomb. The one on the right is 150 square miles as opposed to 400, four square miles. So a nuclear war would suddenly see hundreds or thousands of these firestorms erupt on the surface of the earth. These are the burns suffered by people in Hiroshima. If you're within seven miles of that fireball, you'll get third degree burns. If you're nine miles away, you'll get second degree burns. This is a video. <laughs> of a nuclear, a large strategic nuclear weapon that was tested by the United States in the Pacific Ocean. The photos were taken from a distance of 50 miles away. These palm trees are an island that are within what would be the fire zone that would be created. You know, the bomb was detonated over the ocean, so, you know, massive uh, fire storm didn't create, wasn't created, but as, as the fireball expands, it creates a massive blast wave that moves outward at hundreds of miles an hour. You can see that circle expanding. That's actually on the surface of the ocean, a blast wave moving outward. That blast wave will knock down buildings, uh, crush concrete structures. Uh, and you can see what will happen in a second when the blast wave comes in. You can see it approaching 
and when it hits the island, blasts the trees apart. There are some structures that they had to show what would happen when a nuclear detonation occurred. This is what the fireball would look like 15 miles away. So that's one strategic nuclear weapon. The US and Russia each have 800 to 1,000 of these weapons they can launch within two to 15 minutes. The weapons would be delivered by intercontinental ballistic missiles, which have a 30 minute flight time from the US to Russia or from Russia to the US. Or they can be launched by submarines. If you park a submarine off the coast of Russia or the United States, they're closer so they can hit targets in the US and Russia as little as seven minutes or perhaps less. So what happens? Um, suppose there's a launch. Well, in the United States, NORAD is tasked uh, to detect and confirm a launch within three minutes. There's then a 30 second conference with the president. If it's a submarine launch ballistic missile, you know, it's going to hit in seven minutes, so they don't have very much time. So he's given 30 seconds to decide whether or not to launch a nuclear attack, a retaliatory strike. If he orders a nuclear attack, it takes two to three minutes to give and transmit the launch order. The, the launch officers at the ICBM consoles will receive that order, and it takes them two minutes to launch an ICBM, which are always kept powered up and ready to launch. It takes about 15 minutes for submissiles to launch. If the warning attack was false, then you actually just started a nuclear war by accident. Today, as Scott Ritter pointed out a few minutes ago, there's no defense against Russian hypersonic nuclear weapons. The Russia has just deployed a new uh, ICBM they call Satan II. It carries avant-garde warheads. The avant-garde warheads fly at 15,000 miles per hour and they're maneuverable. The Sarmat has a, a larger range than US ICBMs that can fly over the South Pole. And it's completely immune to any current use missile defense systems as are the avant-garde warheads which travel four miles per second. Russia has also started deploying uh, Zircon hypersonic missiles. They go about half as fast as, I, as the avant-garde does, but Russia is arming ships and submarines with these, and they can get closer to the U.S. shores, and they also can carry nuclear warheads. A Zircon launch from a ship or a sub 100 miles off the East Coast can hit Washington, D.C. in three to four minutes. So what happens? Um, I mean, three to four minutes, you, you, I showed a minute ago, it takes at least five minutes for the president to you know, issue an order, be briefed, issue an order, uh, and have the missiles launch. Well, that's not enough time. The president's going to be killed before he can issue the order for a retaliatory strike. And the military on both sides know that a first strike could take out their command and control systems and make and destroy most of the land-based ICBMs. You know, it's, they have to communicate the order to the silos and a, a large nuclear strike would obliterate all the command and control systems. So there is pre-delegation. Their officers lower down the chain of command that have the ability to launch. If the U.S. and Russia get into a direct military conflict, um, it's going to create great pressure for Russian and U.S. leaders to launch a preemptive nuclear strike because they know all these things about what well, they have no time to retaliate. Their nuclear forces will be destroyed. Well, <clears throat> this year in April, uh, the U.S. Nuclear Posture Review changed the U.S. policy and Biden went along with allowing the U.S. to um, issue a, a preemptive nuclear strike without being attacked by nuclear weapons. Now, a month ago, Putin said that Russia could adopt the U.S. preemptive strike concept. At the time when Putin made that announcement, he also stated that Russia uses a policy of launch on warning. And Putin said, when the early warning system receives a signal about a missile attack, we launch hundreds of missiles that are impossible to stop. Both the U.S. and Russia employ launch on warning. I want to kind of emphasize what that is. You know, a retaliatory nuclear strike is launched when US or Russian early warning systems detect a new uh, enemy nuclear attack. And these are electronic systems. The retaliatory strike is launched while enemy missiles are still in the air and be before any nuclear detonation occurs. In other words, we're launching a nuclear attack before any nuclear detonation occurs that would confirm that they attack that the radars and satellites see is a nuclear attack. So a false warning of attack believed to be true would make the retaliatory nuclear strike a first strike. And there's been a lot of false warnings of attack historically, but when these occur in, in times of relative peace, the military is inclined to not believe that they're real. And we haven't launched that strike, but if we're in a war with Russia, that would change. If the US and Russian presidents are traveling, they're always accompanied 
by what they call a nuclear suitcase. And this is an automated communication device that allows the president to issue a permission order to order a nuclear strike on the other country, on Russia or the US. The US and Russia are the only countries that have early warning systems and launch ready nuclear forces that allow them to launch a retaliatory strike at this point. Once these missiles are launched, they cannot be recalled. It's not like in the movies where they can press a button and say, oh, we made a mistake. This is an image of the NORAD center where the US is always looking out for a Russian attack. The Russians have a similar center. So both sides are constantly looking for signs of an attack. I want to ask, do US leaders believe they can win a nuclear war? I and mean, Scott Ritter made a point of, you know, he made, he's quite correct that US weapon systems are obsolete. But do US, do, do US leaders believe that? Um, Back in 2006, the Council on Foreign Relations published an article called The Rise of U.S. Nuclear Primacy. And it stated, today the United States stands on the verge of attaining nuclear primacy. It could conceivably disarm the long range nuclear arsenals of Russia or China with a nuclear first strike. Nine years later, the Bolton of Atomic Scientists published an article about the new missiles and superfuses that made U.S. nuclear warheads three times more accurate. And what that meant was that U.S. subs now on patrol have three times more warheads than they're needed to destroy all the Russian land-based ICBMs in their silos. And this creates the capacity for disarming nuclear first strike, at least in the minds of war planners. And the question today is, will U.S. and NATO continue to escalate in Ukraine, and will this lead to World War III? And I, you know, U.S. and Russia are both firmly committed to win. It's an existential question for Russia. And apparently it is for the United States who were so heavily invested in it. We, the US and NATO have been funding Ukraine and providing all the weapons and ammunition at this point and mercenaries to keep the war going, $112 billion. You know, we could have built enough high schools in the United States with that to you know, teach 24 million students. You know, the US provides Ukraine with a satellite and aerial, aerial reconnaissance to target Russians. And this recently included um, drones that were sent to attack uh, a Russian strategic nuclear bomber base that's 400 miles inside of Russia. I mean, this is quite a provocation. You know, it's a way to test Russian defenses. They're trying to see how Russian air defenses would react. I mean, it's crazy, you know. Um, Poland is now mobilizing 200,000 troops. You know, Ukraine is just about out of munitions uh, that you know, we've been sending them. Ukraine uses Soviet weapon systems, and we've sent about all the weapon systems we can find, the munitions that would be appropriate for their, the caliber of munitions for their artillery, the missiles they use in the launchers. But NATO's not out of weapons, and Poland's a NATO member, and Poland also has thousands of troops in Ukraine that have been fighting. They've had over 1,000 killed and wounded. Poland has historical designs on Western Ukraine. And Russia has mobilized more than 300,000 troops recently, and they're preparing, according to Colonel Douglas McGregor, they're preparing a, a major offensive. What happens if they go in and the Ukraine, Ukrainian army collapses with the US and NATO sending troops? So this is, I'm gonna show an animation of what would happen that would, with a war that would begin in Ukraine between the US and Russia. This, the, the findings, the, the last part of this video is based on peer reviewed studies to predict the consequences of long-term environmental consequences of nuclear war, which include nuclear winter. And these studies have been published for more than 16 years in journals, and they, they haven't been found to have any errors, although the leaders of the United States have basically ignored the findings, they haven't discussed them. So imagine sometime in the next month or two, Russia launches an invasion, NATO sends in troops, and then uh, in retaliation for a U.S. cruise missile strike against Russian forces, Russia fires a missile and sinks a U.S. guided missile cruiser in the Black Sea. The U.S. then decides to use nuclear weapons to sink Russian ships in the Black Sea. Russia strikes NATO targets throughout Europe. And in response, the U.S. launches a massive nuclear strike against Russia. And Russian early warning systems detect this they launch a massive nuclear strike against the United States and Europe. More than 3,000 nuclear detonations would occur in one hour. The US and Russia have 4,000 nuclear weapons they can use within an hour's time. All the major cities of Europe and the United States and Russia would be incinerated. 
and massive nuclear firestorms would cover more than 100,000 square miles of the Earth's surface. Everything remotely flammable would burn in the fire zones. The scientific studies predict that these firestorms would produce 150 million tons of smoke and soot. This would rise rapidly above the cloud level into the stratosphere where it could not be rained out. The UCLA, UCLA scientists created a, a, a video showing this smoke being spread over the earth. They predict that 70% of sunlight would be blocked in the Northern hemisphere and 35% would be blocked in the Southern hemisphere. The smoke layer would block warming sunlight from reaching the Earth's surface. And this smoke layer would remain for at least 10 years. The loss of warming sunlight would create ice age weather conditions around the Earth. In, central, the, in the central North America and Eurasia, temperatures would fall below freezing every day for the next three years. Ice age weather would prevent food crops from being grown for 10 years. And most humans and land animals would starve to death. Now, this would be a mass extinction event. This image is of a farmer staring up at a cloudless sky. That was, that's a smoke that's blocking the sun. They say that in the northern hemisphere at noon, the sun would re resemble a full moon at midnight. That's how dark it would be. And I don't know, you know, I, I didn't even talk about radioactive fallout or any of the other things would happen but it's not really necessary when you understand what would happen to food crops. So nuclear war is the ultimate crime against humanity. Um, it will be the last crime against humanity because there won't be any humans left if we do this. And sorry to have such a gloomy <laughs> summary, but I'm, I'm glad you all are listening to this and I hope you can take this message to other people. <laughs>